scientist or philosopher to suggest that the reality we perceive is a constructed reality, a model updated and informed by bulletins streaming in from the senses. But Hawkins is, I think, the first to articulate, eloquently and at length, the idea that there is not one such model. There are thousands, one in each of the many neatly stacked columns that constitute the brain's cortex. There are about 150,000 of these columns, and they are the stars of the first section of the book, along with what he calls frames of reference. Hawkins's thesis about both of these is provocative, and it'll be interesting to see how it is received by other brain scientists. Well, I suspect. Not the least fascinating of his ideas here is that the cortical columns in their world-modelling activities work semi-autonomously. What we perceive is a kind of democratic consensus from among them. Democracy in the brain, consensus and even dispute, what an amazing idea. It is a major theme of the book. We human mammals are the victims of a recurrent dispute, a tussle between the old reptilian brain, which unconsciously runs the survival machine, and the mammalian neocortex sitting in a kind of driver's seat atop it. This new mammalian brain, the cerebral cortex, thinks. It is the seat of consciousness. It is aware of past, present and future, and it sends instructions to the old brain which executes them. The old brain, schooled by natural selection over millions of years when sugar was scarce and valuable for survival, says, Cake! Want cake! Mmm! Cake! Gimme! The new brain, schooled by books and doctors over mere tens of years, in which sugar has been overplentiful, says, no, no, not cake, mustn't. Please don't eat that cake. Old brain says, pain, pain, horrible pain, stop the pain immediately. New brain says, no, no, bear the torture. Don't betray your country by surrendering to it. Loyalty to country and comrades comes before even your own life. The conflict between the old reptilian and the new mammalian brain furnishes the answer to such riddles as, why does pain have to be so damn painful? What, after all, is pain for? Pain is a proxy for death. It is a warning to the brain. Don't do that again. Don't tease a snake, pick up a hot ember, jump from a great height. This time it only hurt. Next time it might kill you. But now a designing engineer might say, what we need here is the equivalent of a painless flag in the brain. When the flag shoots up, don't repeat whatever you just did. But instead of the engineer's easy and painless flag, what we actually get is pain, often excruciating, unbearable pain. Why? What's wrong with the sensible flag? The answer probably lies in the disputatious nature of the brain's decision-making processes, the tussle between old brain and new brain. It being too easy for the new brain to overrule the vote of the old brain, the painless flag system wouldn't work, nor would torture. The new brain would feel free to ignore my hypothetical flag and endure any number of bee stings or sprained ankles or torturous thumbscrews if, for some reason, it wanted to. The old brain, which really cares about surviving to pass on the genes, might protest in vain. Maybe natural selection, in the interests of survival, has ensured victory for the old brain by making pain so damn painful that the new brain cannot overrule it. As another example, if the old brain were aware of the betrayal of sex's Darwinian purpose, the act of donning a condom would be unbearably painful. Hawkins is on the side of the majority of informed scientists and philosophers who will have no truck with dualism. There is no ghost in the machine, no spooky soul so detached from hardware that it survives the hardware's death, no Cartesian theatre, Dan Dennett's term where a colour screen displays a movie of the world to a watching self. Instead, Hawkins proposes multiple models of the world, constructed microcosms, informed and adjusted by the rain of nerve impulses pouring in from the senses. By the way, Hawkins doesn't totally rule out the long-term future possibility of escaping death by uploading your brain to a computer, but he doesn't think it would be much fun. Among the more important of the brain's models are models of the body itself, coping, as they must, with how the body's own movement...